Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our six sessions of Jesuit Entrepreneurship Program. Um, for those of you who are new in the program, so Jesuit Entrepreneurship Program started in 2013 uh, with a mission to support Sudan entrepreneurs in all over the world. Uh, we, we have this annual session, uh, this monthly sessions to where, where we um, get into conversations with one of the thought leaders and entrepreneurs uh, to discuss topics related to the Syrian entrepreneurs, where we bring you the questions into the conversations and into the topic. Um, for these sessions, will be in English, and then we're gonna um, subtitle this English translated into Arabic and provide you with the questions online uh, later on. You can be able to ask any questions you have through the comments here in the, in, in the YouTube live or through our groups um, and page in the, for Jesuit programs. Uh, to, to get this rolling, I'm, I'm very honored to welcome um, the, uh, D Daniel Lauren. He's, uh, he's a venture capitalist and an investor uh, in mostly early stage startups. Uh, to, to kind of ask him a bit more, <clears throat> sorry, to ask him more about the questions regarding to the, uh, entrepreneurship, investment, and get more about his personal background um, into that. This is a great opportunity for you all who's looking to to get to reach out to investors to get to know more about uh, this field. Uh, to get this rolling, um, I would give it to Daniel if you can uh, briefly introduce yourself, tell us more about the stuff you're doing, uh, what kind of portfolio to you invest in, or anything you would like to add before we um, also uh, bring bring on more questions to the table. So uh, I'll, I'll take it to you, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a brief description. You know, I operate from from Stockholm in Sweden. So, but basically, I've been working for with uh, investments for since I would say 2011. Uh, because I started out my career, I'm I'm educated at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. So I have a behavioral science background, but then I started by joining Monster.com, which is the world's largest uh, recruitment uh, firm or web, web page when it was brand new with ads, basically. And that was in 2001. Then I worked through this sort of a, the first full cycle of internet startups in Stockholm. We were quite early in Stockholm. Uh, you know, we have a lot of great companies coming out of Stockholm. That's, that's uh, sort of the engineering culture here and also the team working culture, I think. Um, but I started my own company in 2005, which was a B2B company uh, that will focus on procurement and taking over procurement divisions with a sort of a software and uh, an organization to handle big procurement departments. So I sold that in a couple of years, like five years. And then parallel to that, I started an IT consulting company and a recruitment company, so, which I also sold. So I used those money to be an angel investor in 2011, 2012. So there I started invested in, in a very early stage startup, what we can call seed stage, basically. Uh, so I made, uh, I think I made like uh, over 10 investments, I would say, and I'm a partner in two funds. One is a global angel fund, which is called True Global Ventures, and one is a venture capital firm that is called InVenture, where I worked for the last two years. Uh, as a venture partner, and uh, I was responsible for managing Sweden and the, the deal flow in Sweden, and work, worked as a venture capitalist for them for the last two years. But uh, the last half year, I've been starting my own fund called Stockholm Venture Capital, Stockholm VC, uh, which is brand new, and it's gonna it's gonna be open in uh, I would say hopefully in six months. But we already started to do investments, but we haven't filled it up with money. It's gonna be a sub fifty million dollar fund, <clears throat> and we will focus heavily on investing in the space that we call pre Series A, which is uh, the phase where after the seed round, basically. I have invested in all rounds, uh, not really B or C rounds, which are really big, you know. But I've been invested. Um, from from like uh, fifty thousand euros uh, up to no less five thousand euros up to uh, I would say five hundred thousand euros or five million euros even. So this is a fund that focus on where you have traction, where you have a good MVP and stuff like that. And I've tried to take care of my own companies as well. But getting into what I invest in, uh, as I mentioned here for Dania, I, I invested in two Arabic companies uh, actually. And uh, as you know, we have uh, in Sweden uh, quite a lot of uh, Arabic speaking people because we have uh, a lot of migration from the Arabic countries for many years. But 
Uh, there have been uh, Iranians in Sweden for many, many years, uh, even back in the 70s. Uh, so uh, there is a kind of a big, I think that Arabic is the, the second most common language in Sweden. So it's starting up like tech companies now that are grabbing for the Arabic market, which is kind of interesting, I would say. So my, one of my, my last investment is in a company called Kitab Sabtid which is uh, audiobook in Arabic. I don't know if I, I say it right, but uh, it, it should be audiobook. And it's going to be like Audible for the Arabic market. And um, uh, if you know what Audible is, Audible is Amazon.com's uh, uh, audiobook division, which is very, very big. And uh, then I have another company called uh, Funrock, and they're doing a game called Etihad Alabtal, which is also Arabic, and it's going to be Heroes United. So they're going to try to approach the, the sort of the whole MENA region with their uh, mobile strategy game. It's not a non-violent game, it's a strategy game, but you, of course, you're in war with uh, your ally, allies against other allies. So it's a strategy game, so it's an intellectual game. And we already launched it in uh, Egypt, and we just launched it in Bahrain. And we're going to continue to roll it, roll it out. Uh, but I, I normally go into like I'm, I'm a business to business software investor, but I also invest a lot of in consumer mobile internet. There's a lot of mobile, you know, that mobile is taking over the world, it's going to continue doing that. So uh, I've been doing some heavy high tech investments from my former company in Venture because uh, it was a really high tech fund. But now I, I, I mainly I, I try to move towards uh, the consumer market. And one of my last investments, which is a really good one, that just raised an A round, is Karma. And that's karma.life. And they are doing a food waste app. So it's a mobile food waste app. So you, you sell the surplus of the food through the app. Uh, and Kitab Savti is, of course, uh, sort of an audible copy. And Funrook is a strategy game like Clash of Clans, but softer, especially for the MENA markets. And there's I think that uh, going through the Arabic market is a, a sort of a underserved market because uh, the language goes the, <laughs> the other way. So, so you need to rebuild applications basically and then do it in Arabic. So, I think there will be a lot of it. I think that we will export a lot of software to the Arabic markets from from the Nordic, which is I think kind of interesting. But it would be even more interesting if <laughs> if you can export them yourself from Damascus and, and, and other, another city in, in the region where you are native speakers. And uh, getting back to that, I, I, some, some sort of tips what I invest in, what I look for, I mainly look for, I'm very founder centric. Uh, I don't know if you read the, the, the sort of a very famous management book called Good to Great. You know, they say that there's, there's the first who, then what. Uh, I use the same approach. Uh, I try to find very, very good founders because normally you tend to pivot uh, maybe three times, four times before finding your, your sort of final idea. And then uh, you can see that uh, Europe's biggest Spotify is from Stockholm, just close to where I sit. We sit on the same street. It's Beer uh, you know, They're going to IPO now, probably in New York. And uh, Spotify started out as a streaming service for actually films from the beginning. But now it's uh, the world's largest mobile uh, music app. So. I'm very founder-centric, and Don Eliek, the founder of uh, uh, Spotify, he's an extremely good founder. Uh, he's one of the best. And uh, trying to find really good, hardworking uh, founders who just not in, in it for the fame or the vein or the venture capital money, but who, who is really in it for the grit. They want to change something. That's, that's what I'm looking for. So I can go on for like an hour myself just trying to, to tell what I look for and what I invest in, but it will be more interesting to get a sort of perspective what I, how I maybe can help you with some tips. Um, well, let, me, let me ask a few questions. Uh, the is in gaming and one of them is in audiobooks um, to different uh, kind of industries. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you ended up being interested in your startups and what kind of data or background um, is there about these industries in the Middle East that, that make this an interesting market for you to get into and these startups interesting investments for you to make? 
Well, if you look at Funrock, which I invested in in 2013, uh, we did a kind of a, a big survey on the Arabic markets and the Arabic speaking market and tried to look for it because if you look for <clears throat> one important thing when investing into mobile games is of course the, the, the user acquisition cost. And it goes up all the time because the competition on Play Store and App Store is getting harder all the time. Then you need to find verticals. And you can find a vertical, and one vertical could actually be doing a game in Arabic. Because uh, most of the games are not really done in Arabic from the beginning. They might be translated into Arabic later. But doing a true native Arabic game, that's a big difference. And also have an Arabic team on place, which really understands the culture uh, in, in the different countries and in the regions. So we have an Arabic team in Egypt that uh, does most in our marketing manager and producer. Uh, he's from Egypt as well. Uh, so, so getting into this market is, of course, it's a sort of a, uh, we said it, it we, we tend to look at it as an underserved market because there have been regions that have been opening up lately also, like Iran is a special region, but uh, uh, if you look, for instance, one of the most successful uh, companies from Sweden is Truecaller. I don't know if you know Truecaller, but it's uh, the world's largest uh, phone book in your phone. And that was also one of the biggest apps in the, in, in the MENA market. Now it's India's biggest uh, app. And we see that coming from Sweden with only nine, 10 million people living here and, and one and a half million in Stockholm, almost 2 million now, uh, we, t we, we tend, to, tend to try to, to look for other countries that we can expand to <laughs> digitally very, very fast. So that's why it's very interesting. And also, if you look at the question was about Audible is uh, sort of a, the Kitab Salt is different from Funrock with Eddie Halal Tal because, but still it's like consumer mobile products. It would be much, much harder to do like a SaaS business to business uh, uh, enterprise software on the market because we don't know the market. Then we need to be purely with a 100% Arabic team in one of the cities that are good. So, so that's basically why we are really good at developing. Um, we have really good developers here in Stockholm due to the, we have Ericsson, which is a very big company. So we can build, we can productify and make really great products. And we think, we tend to think that we see the Arabic markets as really interesting. And as I said, we have uh, Arabic as the second most common language in Sweden now. So it's a kind of, kind of a natural bond now. Makes sense. Uh, so you mentioned also that you're very founder centric, yep. and you know founders shouldn't be in it for the for the fame and for the for the like spotlight and the glory. What are the what are the what I would say if you can summarize the the characteristics of a good founder? Um, what 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 are the boxes that this founder needs to tick for you to feel like okay I can trust this person and put my money behind him? Yeah. To start with, I only invest in teams. Uh, so there need to be uh, more than one founder. Uh, it's good if there are three founders, two founders also okay, but I never invest in a single founder because a single, single founder is, is too much risk. Uh, you know, anything can happen to a single person, but if you have three persons, probably someone can take over. So, and, and that's one of the principles that we use for the venture capital firm as well. But then what you, what you truly look for is, is uh, high adoptability so you need because as i said in the beginning you need to pivot and you need to have some sort of ground vision of, of, of where you want to go with your your product and your company your team how, how will this look like in 10 years actually a little bit of a cliche but you, you want to change something and you want to look for and you know that it's really really hard to change something if you look at the one of the most famous founders now elon musk he's completely you know crazy in many ways uh, he he works uh, like a slave almost day and night he sleeps very little and he has like i think he has like three degrees now and and uh, but but you look for that sort of the grit the the really that you really want to change something that you really want to because you have this in stockholm and everywhere you have this what you call entrepreneurs the people who likes the sort of uh, entrepreneurship lifestyle uh, and they're more like into just doing anything and it's not really that fun for us investors because we we really want to see some real traction that you change something you get a lot of users you change your behavior 
you find a new market or a new vertical. So it's, it's really, I, I don't, there are a lot of things, you know, of course. Last month, uh, we hosted uh, a founder of a social uh, enterprise uh, called Dubara, which is just very, very uh, popular and famous within the Syrian uh, youth. Yeah. Um, and he kept telling us that he felt his biggest drawback was how much he loved Dubara, like his passion and how, how attached he was. And he felt that that was a disadvantage to him. Do you feel like that is a disadvantage with some founders that being very passionate and and you know you, you mentioned the the ability to pivot maybe if someone is so passionate about their idea you know it's very difficult for them to change or to accept to adapt easily to a changing environment no, but that i think that uh, i think that no i think that for him uh, the founder it can be some sort of a curse <laughs> because uh, if you look at your product or, or your service, uh, whatever it be, like a great social network, you know, uh, some investors might say that, well, you should expand also into this vertical and this vertical. And that can be really hard for you because you love your vertical. But normally, I think it's good. I think it's good. Uh, but the only thing that you need to have is, is, a, is a big vi vision that is big enough. If you want to raise venture capital, you don't need to raise venture capital. There's a lot of great companies that haven't raised venture capital. But, but um, we need to invest in, in moonshots, you know, uh, companies that can go to the moon and back. Like, uh, you know, an early investor in Apple has made trillions of dollars. You know, an early investor in, in Instagram that was acquired fast by Facebook also made a lot of money. So it's, it's more about, I don't, I don't think so. I think that uh, passion and commitment are extremely important. You know, you should, you should, live, your, you should live your startup. I don't really agree. It can be a curse personally. <laughs> that I can agree. But for me, it's just great if you're passionate about what you do. You know. That's might be. Um, I, I have a question. Um, sorry, Daniel, if I may ask. When, when do you think is the right time for people to reach out to an investor? Um, when is the yeah. perfect time to it's do a so? Good, it's a good question because it, it, there, there are basically, you know, there are many levels that you can get funding on many levels of investment. There are many, many also many sources in, that you can get investment from. Um, I can only talk from sort of a Nordic perspective or like a US perspective. I don't, I'm not really, I don't know how it works in Damascus. It's bit, probably harder to get investments. But, but the thing is that uh, if you, for instance, are building uh, a product that is, um, let's say it's a mobile game. Uh, which is kind of hard to build because you need to spend, I would say, like in dollars, like five, six hundred thousand dollars just on the first MVP. You, you need to raise capital because you need to hire developers, you need to have uh, artists, you need to have producers, you need to have a good back end and stuff like that. So you need to raise at least, I would say, in Sweden, in Sweden, five hundred thousand dollars you need to raise. Uh, so, but if you're building a sort of SaaS B2B solution where you can have you yourself and a team as founder, somebody can code, somebody can sell, you don't need that much venture capital. You can get customers anyway. So it really depends on what kind of startup you're building. And if you're building a SaaS business, it's very easy to calculate when you should go for venture capital because every venture capitalist in the SaaS business, which is the business to business of, you know, business to business in, in software as a service, like cloud solutions and stuff like that, you can calculate easily what the, what the companies were depending on the growth. So, so there is an investor, uh, the big investors, they normally tend to go in quite late in those companies. So then in those companies you need to fund by friends, fools and family and yourself basically based on sales or another income source. It can be consulting in that sense because you can be that. Uh, a good consultant, that's a system system developer and stuff like that. But but if you're looking for for like you're gonna build a mobile game, then it's really really hard. You know, we also invested. I, I've done a new investment now just recently. Actually, it's, it's a Swedish, uh, but it's uh, he's he's of Arabic heritage. His name is Mustafa, uh, and uh, he speaks Arabic. Uh, he lives in Malmo, south of Sweden, and he does a company that is called uh, My Social. And that's, that's a way for YouTubers to get more reach by uh, he's building a platform to, so they can get more followers uh, on their channels and how they can market. 
so he's building a sort of a semi business to business social network. Uh, so he's got income. So his figures, we only look at his, uh, his YouTubers and his uh, customers that are getting the brands. That's basically his two, two, uh, his two leverage points. So it's getting venture capital, it really depends. But you no, know, in the early stage, you also need good advisors. I just left the board of Karma. I've been working with them for four years for free. I, I only invest money. I, I haven't uh, got a single dime from sitting in the board. So I helped them for four years for free, sitting in the board for four years, and also being, uh, you know, being uh, taking all their questions regarding recruitment, uh, strategy, uh, raising capital again and again and again. They're like <laughs> all their pivots, getting more angels on board, and uh, you know, restructuring the cap table, stuff like that. So, so it's really good to get uh, in the early phase. If you're looking to get your first investment, it's it's even more valuable to get people who can get you your second investment than getting just the money because. Money in the first phase is normally very expensive. You know, normally you have a twenty percent dilution when you take in an investor. So if you have a low valuation and you just take in money, you have to get, you know, let a lot of the shares go to a, to an investor that uh, maybe doesn't help you. So in the beginning, active capital is extremely important. It's getting less important you, the later you come in a company. Uh, Hopefully you go and do an IPO like Snapchat, and then you know <laughs> you have the world as investors or Facebook. Uh, was that a, an answer? I think you're here today. Yeah, that will tap into the um, to the question um, that I asked. Yeah, thanks. Um, to get this also going into understanding um, the relationship between a startup and investor. Uh, when someone contacts you, what kind of documents do you prefer always to have yeah. as an investor? Because That's also a good question. Yeah, uh, I, I always ask for the pitch deck. And a pitch deck, you know what a pitch deck is. And, and you should listen to This Week in Startup with Jason Calacanis. He's one of the world's famous, most famous business angels now. He wrote a book called Angel, which is available on Audible as well. And it's a really great book talking about how investors should invest in startups and they can actually learn a lot but i always ask for the pitch deck i want to see the cap table and i want to speak to the founders or the team i don't want to speak to some banker who's trying to sell the startup so and and you should also do your homework you know for for me since i do investments uh, in in swedish arabic companies they can you know you can contact me you know but you can also look in what i invest in and if somebody come with oh i got this new idea for how we should make like uh, uh, like a high tech investments with uh, solar panels connected in some strange way that's not an investment for me i'm not that kind of investor so it's it's really good to do your homework and it's also really good if you have somebody who can vouch for you in my network. And if you look at LinkedIn or Facebook, especially LinkedIn, Facebook is growing now, but LinkedIn, you can see that I'm connected to this guy and this girl and they know me. And uh, I can see that when you approach me, you can say that I can see that you invested in Fundrock. You would probably be in, in, interested in this startup, which is a mobile gaming company. Or I invested in karma, you should probably be interested in this food waste startup or stuff like that. Normally, people contact me like I got like 15, 20 per week at LinkedIn, and most of them are completely out of range, you know. Norwegian solar panel company and stuff like that. And it's just uh, so um, it's okay to contact people on LinkedIn, send direct emails, send it to VCs. But if you look for venture capital firms, normally people tend to contact venture capital firms too early. And the venture capital firms, they are just, oh, good, you can come or you can pitch. And people get a really, li little bit happy about that. But I think that venture capital invest in, I would say, that maybe lower than 0.5% of all the companies that they look, look for, maybe like 0.3%. So getting a venture capital in investment is like, it's really, really hard. So when you look for venture capital, you need a 12-month cohort. You need to be, need to be in that venture capital space. So it, it's, it's actually better to go for uh, angel investors or local investors or friends, fools, and family. And also people that can work for equity. So you're getting a new partner who's a developer or a, 
uh, a marketing person or something like that. Um, I have a question about uh, the role of the investor in the startups. Um, yeah. So how, how deep does the uh, investor get involved in the startup in terms of the strategy? Um, you know, as a VC investor, do you get more involved than an angel investor? Um, and, and how much, from a startup perspective, how much would you advise these startups to let um, it kind of get more and more involved in their uh, strategy and building up their company? That's a good question. Uh, it, it, normally, a venture capital firm take a board seat or what is called a board observer seat, uh, even if they do a small investment. Because uh, in a fund, uh, they might have like 30 startups or 30 companies in their fund. And uh, normally, you share them between the partners and, and, and the, the associates working at the firm. So normally, and, and they also try to help you with advisors. So you should take those advices, but getting into the venture capital space, you know, it's uh, then then it's not it's it's like in ninety nine percent of all the cases, it's written in the new term sheet, which is a sort of a new shareholders agreement that you have a right to a board seat and blah blah blah. That is normally negotiated even on the Series A uh, seed level. Taking on an angel investor is 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 uh, different. Because what you want to have with an annual investment, you want to have somebody who can truly add value to your company. You know, if you're doing a mobile company, it would be good with somebody who invested in mobile gaming before. Uh, and um, if you take like for Karma, for instance, we have a really good angel investor. He's called Magnus Bergman. He's been working with Truecaller with product road mapping, and he's been very, very useful and helpful as an angel in 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 Karma and. Uh, so, so it, it's uh, getting the money from experience and season business angel is super, super good if you can get that. And they're normally like former entrepreneurs made their money themselves and now they're investing money and they get special competencies in, 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 in various fields and, and especially big networks. Getting into board, it's, it's uh, not necessary, but um, you should definitely have active advisors and try to even negotiate that. You try to put in some money and also put in some time. But the board is normally like, you cannot make super much impact in the board in the, in the really first stages because it's, it's such a small company, you know. The board decision they're taking every day, you know, in a startup. That's true. Um, and from a legal perspective, because we get these questions a lot, um, from our community, from a legal perspective, what would be um, the main things that an, uh, a startup or an entrepreneur should be looking at or really kind of diligently studying in the legal terms that are presented from investors? Normally, when you do uh, <clears throat> an angel investment deal in a really early, early phase, uh, you use in a shareholders agreement or a term sheet. Uh, and, and in that term sheet, it's, it's, it should be very founder friendly. One big important thing is vesting. And vesting is, of course, uh, it, it's the money that, uh, it's, it's the time that you should uh, spend uh, in your startup. Or if you leave the startup, you will lose the shares. So, so, so vesting is, is one important. And there are free term sheets and shareholders agreement that you can get from a lot of places that are useful in, 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 in most of the countries uh, all over the world. Uh, but, but I would say that, you know, getting into a company really, really early with maybe a team of three, a team of two, a team of four, you know, the biggest risk is, is always by the investor. So, and the investor knows if there's, it is a smart investor at least, that you cannot, uh, you cannot have two tough terms, you know. You have to be very founder-centric because if the founding team leaves, it, you have nothing, basically. You lose your investment. So the legal terms are, you know, they should be standardized and it should be like that. If you quit your startup as a founder together with one out of three, you might lose some of your shares and that is the vesting clause and that is kind of normal when you're taking money. And that is also important for the other founders. 
because if one founder leaves and owns like 30% and I said, I want to keep my 30% and you, you should do the, you should do the job. I join IBM, you know, <laughs> so it's, uh, I would say the vesting clauses are really important. Okay. Um, so just uh, just following on that. Um, so what is the so let's say this, there's three founding teams. Uh, sorry, three founding members in the team. Diluted. Their shares keep getting diluted the more investors they get in. Let's say yep. by the VC stage or by seed stage. Yep. What's the kind of ideal shareholding percentage that the founding team should maintain? I would say that they keep getting diluted and yeah, I agree with you. So they need to think about you know yeah. control exactly uh, and as uh, I would say that when, when you take in VC money you are normally in like a pre series A or a series A round when you take institutional money uh, and that's basically globally because the fund sizes are there are that size so then you should, I would say that a, a common rule is to say that the own uh, the the uh, Founding team should have at least 50% when you take in institutional money. Because when you take in institutional money, you can normally have like normal salaries, you can have stock option programs, stuff like that. So you get like a normal job, but still you have a nice equity stake. And if you have 50% uh, and you take in venture capital money, you would at least stay over 10% per founder if you're three, even when you get diluted on 20%. So I would say that 50% when you take in institutional money, but when you take in business angels, you can you know, uh, at the, at the, you, you can of course keep like 90% or 80% of your company, but then you normally do another round, but then you get into the venture capital round, you should have at least 50%, I would say, as founders. It can be a single founder, but you know, you should have that. I think so, I think so. That's extremely helpful, thanks. Um, so I wanna just uh, shift the conversation a little bit about, um, like foreign investments that are interested in the region and in the Middle East. Um, do you see more investors like yourself looking at the Middle East as a growth region and uh, to tap into potential that's, that's over here? Um, we have a lot now, I mean, the, the scene is getting more active. So we've got many kind of funds that are already established and a lot of new ones that are coming up in the region investing in startups. Should the startups, I mean, do they have more options now? Do you see more international money interested in, in, in kind of this, this industry out here? Um, I would say that the, there's definitely much more interest for the, the Middle East market. You can look at my two investments, but of course, we have Kareem, which is the sort of a Uber of the Arabics, <laughs> uh, which is a Swedish founder. So uh, they're definitely more interested in the region. And I think that uh, uh, we can also see that uh, it's, it's getting, hopefully things are getting calmer now that uh, it will draw a lot of more capital into the region because there's, there's so many people uh, that, uh, uh, you know, looking at Sweden, it's not really an interesting market in that sense because it's only 10 million people living here. You know, and not all is, is like, uh, not everybody is a prospect for a mobile game. But if you look at the, the, the Middle East market, it's enormous. I think it's like um, the addressable market is uh, for a billion people or something like that. It's, it, it's a massive market in that sense. And we've done some market research uh, in, um, in, uh, in Sweden. And for us, you know, you know, you're one hour ahead of us, so it's, it's not really a big issue for us to do investments because we can speak with you like now and almost every time because you have almost the same office hours as ours. Finland has the same time zone as you have, basically, so Helsinki is on the time. So that is also good for us, uh, that you can easily access uh, the region. And as I said, I think that also that we have these uh, people that are coming, coming uh, to Europe, Arabic speaking has changed the Nordics in a way that that uh, it wasn't really calculated. So I think that those uh, many of those people will take ideas out of here and take them to their sort of home market uh, where they come from, which you can see. And, and that is what's happening now with a lot of companies. So I think definitely you will see more venture capital investment coming into your region. Absolutely. 
That's great. That's great. money for her market. Yeah, that's sure. Amazing. I don't know. Uh, Yamana, I think that's the key Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know about the valuation or stuff like that, but uh, I, I, you know, we, I haven't looked into you know doing a direct investment. The only investment I made has been in companies that are coming from Stockholm, but they have a, like a co-locating office in Cairo or uh, Alexandria or in Dubai. So I haven't done any direct investment into the region, uh, and that is that is something that would be definitely interesting to look at, but. Uh, of course, you need to look at uh, you need to look at the legislation uh, situation, but uh, but definitely you can also see that uh, you know everything is digital. So maybe valuations can be attractive in your region as well because uh, uh, it's probably cheaper than building a startup out of here from Stockholm, which is very expensive. You know, with massive uh, you know uh, massive prices on housing and stuff like that. So, what is the seed valuation in in, in Damascus now? That would be interesting to hear. The uh, kind of average value. Yeah. It's out because there aren't many, um, and it's kind of guesswork, and it's probably more based on the the region. Um, I would say around 1.5, 1, 1, 1.5. Million dollars. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's basically a little bit of the same as in Sweden. But as I said, maybe there are not enough, so you can get a really good uh, sort of data point on it. OK, but you had a question. I questions as well from, from people that have been watching. I'd love to get some questions in before the, our time is up. Yeah. Um, Yamana, can, can you share with us a few of those? Yes. Uh, we have a question from Rahaf saying that uh, what if uh, the idea is new in the country, but the assessment of needs through market research s showed that few people in need for this idea, yet no one to fulfill it. Uh, would you uh, be interested as an investor in investing in this idea or not? Okay. You have to clarify that. Would I be interested in what idea? Uh, she didn't say. Okay, but, but what, what was the question? It was a question about. She have uh, she has a new idea, yep. uh, but uh, the assessment of need uh, through market showed that few people in need for this idea or this product. Would you, as an investor, be interested in this kind of ideas? Ah, uh -huh, okay, okay, uh, like like a really sort of a pre minimum viable product uh, phase. Uh, so you really you, you only have an idea and you want to have you want to look for investment and see if it's possible to to uh, to do this uh, venture. Is that the question? No, she's saying that the customers are very yep. few, uh, but the idea is new in the, okay. in her country. So would you, as an investor, be in, uh, interested in investing in a new idea but few customers? Oh yeah, yeah. Now I understand. Okay, yeah. yeah as I said in the in, in the beginning, it, it's uh, if you're running a company that already has customers, it's normally a business to business startup, <laughs> hence the word. But um, yeah, definitely you can take a look at that. It really depends, you know, uh, because uh, uh, business to business companies they can of course expand in a very different way, you know. Uh, they can, uh, you know, I know that Aurora's fund and our fund, we have invested in companies that hasn't that many customers, but they're doing something very new in AI or something like that. So definitely it's interesting to look at. Absolutely, I would say. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Um, did the team play a big role in getting an investment or not? Because someone, uh, he, don't ha he doesn't have a big or a strong team, but he need an investment. Would the investor be interested in this kind of startup or not? Well, I, I think that uh, you know you need to have a team. It's very hard to in invest in a single founder. But the team doesn't all need to be founders. But you need to have you need to have a team working. Of course, you can have a team that has less equity or even no equity that can be hired. Uh, so, so definitely the team is important. Uh, so, when when you when you produce your deck, you should al al always uh, always uh, always view the team. You should you should also always see the team 
who are the team, what are they doing, you know, so it's very important, yeah, it is, but they don't need to be founders, you know, they can be employed, or they can be like, normally they work for equity if you don't have any money, so, but it is important, I would say it is really, really important. Okay, so um, what are the, uh, the things that investors focus on? We, we know that uh, the team is very important. What else? What are the things that you focus on as an investor? Yeah, I would say that it's, it's very different depending on what investor you approach, and that is why you should do your homework when you're pitching. If you, for instance, are a business-to-business -business software here, you should look for investors that are investing in business-to-business -business software. My former venture capital firm, Inventure, invests a lot of business-to-business -business software. So you should also look for... Uh, the, the important thing is getting venture money is, 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 of course, that if you look at professional investors, they need to have uh, their money multiplied by at least 10 times, even more, you know? If you look at uh, the angel investors, the mathematics between for an angel investor is that you need to make 30 investments, you need to have an average holding time on at least, I would say, 8 to 10 years. And uh, in that 8 to 10 years, and in those 30 companies, you maybe, have, you maybe have two home runs, two big companies. And those big companies that are going to return all your other investments. And that is a little bit the same for the venture capital firms. That is called, they are called the power law, the VC. So normally, <laughs> when, you look, when you look at companies, you need to look for companies that can be really, really, really big. You know, they can go for really big markets. They can, uh, you know, the, and you have an awesome team that are doing something that nobody else is doing. That can also be like that, you know. So there, there, there's a popular firm now in Silicon Valley that is called Vicarious that are trying to replicate the human brain which is quite hard <laughs> and uh, it's a neuroscience guy who's the CEO and he's doing something that is really hard but he got all the investors all the cool investors Elon Musk founders found Peter Thiel you know so you need to do something really 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 unique or you need to go for a really big market or you need to have really good tractions with your cost customer and you need an awesome team Yeah, that's a great summary. I hope that answers the question, Yamana. Uh, I I wanted to ask, like, I wanted to to have a little bit of a discussion around um, com like com investments in Syria. I know the situation currently is a bit tricky. It's not ideal for for investors to come in from the region. But would would you invest in a company in Syria if it had the right team, if the idea was great, and if the market was not just Syria, but the team was based inside Syria? Would that be something you would consider? I would say that it really depends. Me as a business angel now, I'm starting up my new fund here, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we're up to that soon. And we have a strategy. And that strategy is not to invest in Syria because we can't be on place in Syria. We're only two people now and we cannot cover the market. And our philosophy is to we need to be deep in the network. But looking as a business angel, and if you say that you're coming with something that is simil similar to what I invest, it can be like a mobile gaming studio, it can be like the new Karma food waste app for Syria, I would definitely be interested as a business angel because I already know the vertical and I can speak, to you, speak with you this way, you know, I can travel down or you can travel here, you know. It's it's not really that uh, difficult. It's it's more like uh, it's more like getting into this uh, situation. I think that you it's always important to have feet on the ground. You know, you need to travel down. You need to be there a lot. You need to n know your local community. You need to know the other investors and the other entrepreneurs. And and that is that is uh, I think that is much easier for maybe a already you know already Arabic based investor working out from Dubai or I don't know Israel or something place that is closer to, to commute. It will take some time for us to get down to, to Damascus and uh, but getting a very good business angel I would say that that is definitely possible. And I think that one thing that would be good for, for Damascus if you, if you can have some sort of angel list. I don't know if you know about angel list. 
But Angel is this Angel CEO is 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 where the business angels syndicate investments uh, in in US. And you need probably to have like a local angel list where investor could tag along to local people. So if I should do my investment in Syria, I would probably back another Syrian sort of business angel or entrepreneur that can be on place that can help me. And we will syndicate maybe with five business angels in a, in a, in a company that we think uh, are doing something that we know about. So it, we, need for, uh, we need to sort of build a network there locally, and we, or at least we need somebody who does it. And um, would it matter if the startup focusing on only local market or um, as a perspective of the national investor, you would you prefer for any startup that planning to move? I would say that every startup who's looking for venture money should not focus on a local market. You should, of course, if you look at the local market and you say, okay, your local market is basically bigger than our local market in Sweden, but it's still only a local market. Everybody's looking for international investments. So, so you, you need to think broader. Or if you're doing, for instance, a, uh, like Karma are doing a food waste app, you should, of course, think of the whole region as your market or the country that it works. Maybe it doesn't work in Iran, you know, and stuff like that. But, but, uh, but you should consider the big markets. And the biggest uh, business to business market uh, for consumer uh, business to business market is still USA. So, so it's still US who has the largest uh, business to business um, software startups in the world and the software company. So they are acquiring, I think, like 30% of all the companies that, are, that is coming up that are becoming something. They're acquired by Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon now. So definitely you should go, you should look globally. Build locally and uh, think globally. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, over time, it's like a close to end, but I would love to leave it for you for like a final thought uh, yep. or maybe a recap for the stuff we, we, we talked um, for a minute or two. Do you have any final feedback, uh, advice, um, learnings that you would love to share uh, with, our, with our viewers? Yeah, I would say that. Floor, then we have one question as an investor. Um, what what would you define as a successful? Like, what? How do you define or what's the end uh, goal? Is it an exit? Is it just a, a, a profitable company? Is it an IPO? Mm -hmm. It's a good. It's a good success? question. You know, it's really. But but you know, define uh, define success is actually success defined by the founder itself. You know, you can do a startup, I've done a lot of startup myself who's been quite successful, but I sold them and I got a lot of money, but I didn't get any fame, you know, <laughs> so, but they were financially successful. So, so uh, if you, it, it's actually defined by yourself. If you're setting up a goal, I should do this, and you do that, that is a success. But as an investor, you need, to uh, get the sort of, um, you need to get a, get a, both a financial success uh, and also a success of, uh, like for instance, Spotify, they haven't made profit yet, but they have, I think, 40 million paying customers now. So it is a success. It is a global company that is a success in many different ways. And it, it, it put Sweden on the map again, and it put uh, the investors who invested in Spotify on the map, and that's really good for them. So I would say that, Getting, you know, if you have uh, the most successful companies of all is Facebook and Apple, of course, but, 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 you know, getting to, it's different from the founder's perspective from the investor's perspective because the investor need both money and <laughs> also fame in that sense that it adds value to the fund or the person itself. But, um, I know that, for instance, you should, you should try to connect. An advice that I would give you is you should try to connect with a fund here in Sweden that is actually brand new. That is called Norsken. Uh, you know, Aurora Borealis is the sort of light that we have up north, and uh, Norsken is the Swedish name of the fund. And they are doing investments uh, all over the world, uh, even in Syria. And Syria is, 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 still, is a war zone, so they're definitely doing investments. And they have like a 30... So it's like $35 million fund now with only private money coming from three really 
great entrepreneurs and a couple of more more people who do investments. So you should you should I, I can definitely try to connect you with them. They invested in Karma. So uh, and they have uh, this Norquin house as well. And trying to connect with these hubs. Uh, there are a lot of hubs and there are a lot of people that actually want to help but the best thing to help is actually getting business together uh, trading is the best way so I want to know more about what is you know what are the benefits with the sort of Damascus and Syrian entrepreneurship uh, uh, situation you know because uh, I, I think that uh, there might be some sort of development uh, competence or marketing competence or whatever you you of course have the arabics but what what are the core core benefits with damascus you have, we have some core benefits with stockholm but we also have some problems with stockholm one is housing of course so but giving some sort of advice here is i think that there are so many good uh, sources now in getting a lot of good information and i would say that Listening to This Week in Startup with Jason Galakanis is really good. I think that every entrepreneur should do that. If you want to have more fun, you should look at the, the series Silicon Valley, uh, which is actually quite, uh, it's, it's actually very, very, it's, it's basically the same in Stockholm. And that's more fun. And it's also, you learn a lot from fundraising. Of course, it's corn and it's funny, but, but yes, I think you should do that. You should also try to read about, um, uh, the entrepreneurs that inspire you. I've been really inspired by Elon Musk and these great, you know, entrepreneurs. And I, I constantly read, read a lot and listen a lot to podcasts. And, and, and I learned to become a venture capitalist just by listening to, to and reading books, you know. So all skills are actually, you know, they're learnable. So it's more like uh, read a lot, learn a lot, listen a lot. And 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 uh, try to find sort of your your way of doing this. And, and the world is truly global now, so it's just to it's just to listen and learn. There are fantastic, you know, sources now that weren't like in five years. So I think it's good. I think you can do something fast. And then of course you can, if you're doing a technical startup, you can always speak to Google, Amazon, and those companies that are quite helpful with the programs, even Microsoft, getting discounts. And stuff like that so and uh, of course try to be a team that is advice as well not go for money with a single founder that is hopeless I would say thank you so much Daniel this was a very very useful conversation thank you for sharing all the, um, the your recommendations in the books shows links um, I think they're all great. I think whoever's been watching us for the past hour, go back, view again, and write down all of these books and shows and links that Daniel had mentioned. I think they're extremely useful, all of them. Um, and thank you again for your time. Sufyan, I don't know if there's any final words you want to wrap up the conversation with. Uh, well, I just want to thank Daniel. I want to thank the people who have been watching us. Um, as, as we promised at the beginning of this call, we kind of uh, subtitle. Uh, this YouTube uh, within two weeks, maybe, uh, and then post it again so you can uh, also benefit from the conversations and, um, and have it with the language. Um, I want to tell everyone to keep watching also the series of uh, sessions that we publish in Jisur uh, Entrepreneurship Bootcamp. Next month, we will have Carl from, uh, he's a co founder and CEO of uh, one of the most successful startups in the, in the MENA region, Kareem. Um, so we'll definitely get to know more about his thoughts and ideas about running a business in the Middle East. Uh, I want to thank you also, Dania and Yamana, for, for your help on that. All your great questions. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely see you guys again next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for your time. Take care. Good luck with all your investments. Good luck to you as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.